Hello, I'm Guy, and this is Guy Robot. Hello, and welcome to the third and final part in my NAS build series. If you haven't seen them already, you might want to watch part one, where I actually go through what this NAS build is and get it set up, part two, where I go through my ASXi configuration. Today is the nitty gritty details of how to go around actually getting free NAS set up and working, including configuring it for Windows file sharing and for iSCSI hosts. So let's dive right in. So we go onto the virtual machine tab and we're going to use free NAS 9. I have played around with free NAS 10. There's still a couple of quirks in it. And I've also found that when I ran it in a virtual machine after a reboot once, Grub just completely freaked out and wouldn't start again. And that is not quite the stability level I want for what's going to be one of my main SANs at home. As such, we're going to go with the latest stable 9 version. So we go into virtual machines, hit create register VM, create new virtual machine. Uh, I would just say if we ever got to the scenario where my ESX host became corrupted and I just had the backup data store, then that's where we can do this register existing virtual machine to import it from the data store. But we're going to do create new virtual machine. We're going to give it a unique name. We're going to call it GTP NTPT for GTP new port, SAN02. We're going to have it at 6.5. It's other operating system, and that's FreeBSD 64 bit, which is what FreeNAS is based on. We're going to install it onto Intel SD1 as far as this is concerned, but we're going to customize it as well. Now we're going to start by giving it all six CPU cores. I've got 32 gig of RAM in this thing, but we're going to give it 16 gig and we're going to say reserve all of that memory so it's exclusively for FreeNAS. Is 16 gig enough for FreeNAS? Depends on your needs. For what I'm going to use it for, yes, I believe it is. I could pass through more, but I would like to have a few gig available so that I can do other VM testing on here. One of the main reasons I'm doing this is so I can have a secondary FreeNAS configuration running and being tested that I can pretty much just swap over in the course of a virtual machine reboot cycle. If I have higher RAM here, I'm not going to be able to spin up a second instance of FreeNAS with, say, 8 gig of RAM, which means there's no way I would actually be able to do that test without shutting down the first one, which defeats the point. So I'm going to cap it at 16 gig. Hopefully that will be enough. And then I'm going to have hard disk. So we've got Intel SD1, 8 gig, which should be plenty for FreeNAS. And I'm going to do it as a thick provisioned lazily zeroed, which means it's going to already specify that's a full whack hard disk now rather than trying to dynamically resize it as we go. And then I need to add a second hard disk, and that's also going to be 8 gig. And that one is going to go onto internal SSD 2. So then if we look at these, we've got one on the first SSD and one on the second SSD. So that's where we're going to have our physically mirrored ZFS from. We've got a SCSI controller here. I don't think I really want the SCSI controller, so I'm just going to set the hard disk to be on a SATA controller. Now, I can't think of any particular reason I would desperately want it to be on a SATA controller from a technical standpoint. The reason I'm doing this is because that means if I've only got a SATA controller, for my virtual disks, then I know that anything that's a SCSI device is actually one of the real SAS SCSI devices directly attached to the system. Everything that's a SATA device, so it shows up as ATA in FreeNAS, I'm going to know is a virtual device. So it's just that bit of extra sanity for me and to group them all together so I don't accidentally click or do something on the wrong one. So now I can get rid of the NSI Logic Parallel Virtual SCSI bus. And here we are, we've hit an error. Welcome to the wonders of the new VMware interface. However, if you press escape, which is a hidden option, it normally carries on. We'll get rid of that in a minute then. We'll leave it for now. And we will also add a bunch more network cards. We've got this iSCSI one. We want to add two, three, four, and one for the management one. So then we're gonna have five different network cards. And we're going to connect one to each iSCSI one and one to the manual one. So it pretty much ma matches up to the physical hardware underneath it. And finally, we're going to do add another device, add a PCI device. And we are going to pass through the LSI 2008 PCI device, which is our SAS HBA. Press next, press finish. And now that's created, we can click to go into it, go back into edit. We can get rid of that SCSI controller that it wouldn't get rid of before. And we can also add a CD-ROM drive, which I've realized I forgot to add. And that CD-ROM drive, we will connect to a data store ISO file. 
and that's where we connect to the FreeNAS one we uploaded earlier on, and we will stick that on the SATA controller as well. Hit save. And at this point, we are ready to install FreeNAS. So all we have to do now is press the play button on the virtual machine, and then we'll just whack enter to start installing FreeNAS. So a nice, easy install here. We literally just get to do install or upgrade. Then where do we install it to? You'll see because we've done the pass through of the HBA, it's got these four Western digital drives that VMware never actually saw as for data stores. They're all the DA0, 1, 2, and 3. And then we're going to select these ADA for the VMware virtual hard drives. So these are going to be our two mirrored ZFS install that we're going to put it on. It'll tell us that everything is going to be erased, but that's fine because they are empty, newly created 8 gig virtual disks anyway. So proceed with installation. Put in a root password. All right, there we are. That's it. The installation is done. Please remove and reboot the installation media. So that's nice and easy on a virtual machine. So what we're going to do is just power this down because it's finished with for now. Then we can disconnect the CD-ROM. Not as easy as it should be, really. Not as easy as it used to be. There we go. And restart the machine. And now we should boot into our FreeNAS install. And there we are. FreeNAS is starting up. Uh, there we are. FreeNAS is now installed and configured. Now, as you can see, it's given us an IP address of 10.01.211 for us to configure it to. So let's go to that. FreeNAS, again, we're going to log in with the root account we've created on this one. Annoyingly, I don't think FreeNAS actually lets you specify separate accounts. So now we're going to go through the initial setup wizard. So put in our location for time zone purposes. Good old United Kingdom. Then we are going to skip this step if it's going to let us. All right, we're going to exit the wizard then because we don't actually want to create this just yet. So we're going to go through and do a couple bits of basic configuration here. So the first thing we're going to do is create a test user for me to authenticate with without worrying about Active Directory. So we will create that in here. And this will just be used for us to do some testing in a minute when we're going to compare uh, the SMB Windows file sharing versus iSCSI and the different speeds on the various ones that we're going to have. So we will OK that. OK, then we're going to go into system. I'm not sure there's much we need to configure here. One thing we do want to do is the host name. So we are gtpnptsan02.guitp.org. And annoyingly, it didn't actually configure those settings from earlier on. So we're going to write that in now. So that's an important thing. If you cancel the wizard, it will not do anything you've done so far. Hit save. I'm going to make it scrub the drives more often than once a month. I'm going to make it do it every 14 days just because this isn't a production system and it's not that busy, so I might as well keep on checking it. Okay, so then that's the basic system configuration done. So the next place we're going to go is into the network and do some configuration there. Well, you probably didn't see it based on the incredibly quick speed that that whizzed through on the video. It actually took ages when it was booting trying to do DHCP across four different network cards, which you can control C out of. That's because it's picked up all the cards, but only one of them is wired in at the moment. And for some reason, the DHCP client isn't clever enough to tell whether a link is up or down. Actually, it will be clever enough. It's just it's a virtual switch. There you are. So virtually it's up. It's just not getting an IP. Anyway, what we need to do is now give an IP address, a static IP address to everything on our network rather than using DHCP. So we'll add in our default gateway. We'll add in our name servers. Hit save on that. Then we'll go into our interfaces. And at the moment, we've got nothing configured here. So we're going to configure each one of these interfaces. Now, if we go back to VMware, we can have a look at go into shell number nine and do ifconfig. And we can see that EM4 is the one that's been given an IP address. So we know that EM4 is going to be the one that is our main LAN port, so we'll call it LAN, and we'll give that one a static address in line with the other SAN devices on my network, and we'll make that a slash 24, and we will press OK on that one. Now, at this point, what should happen is it will drop me off there, so we go back to the new IP address, log back in, go into network interfaces again, and now we just want to add all the other interfaces. So again, we're going to give these very similar names to what we did with everything else, but I'm going to give them different IP addresses this time. 
and each of these are going to be on their own subnet, so they are completely separate. I'm just going to go through and do that for each of the four different iSCSI ports that we've got, which, if you remember, are connected to four different virtual iSCSI switches in VMware. So now that's done, it's also worth noting, if you do want to do link aggregation because you're either directly connected to a switch or because of whatever configuration you've got, you want to do link aggregation at the level of free DAS rather than higher up the chain. So, for example, you could do, I believe, link aggregation in VMware and then just pass a single interface through. Not sure on that, theoretically. Anyway, um, you could do it here in link aggregation and set up an aggregated link across all the different things you want. But we're not doing that here, just so you're aware of it is. So now all we need to do is go and finish up the last bits of configuration. So if we now go across into directory, we can join the Active Directory. Important you get the full domain name. That should now bind and join the domain and create an account in it. However, it's worth noting we can't actually log in with this account. FreeNAS doesn't let you do that, which is a bit annoying. It's solely for permissions on individual shares. So that all being done, I will now be able to create shares that use my domain credentials to access them. However, I won't necessarily be able to do much else with it. Active Directory update successful. Now what we should be able to do, if we go back to our shell, is cat slash etc slash password. So if we do cat etc password, you'll see the local accounts that have been created there already. The one that I created for test purposes is going to be, but not the domain accounts. However, if we type in wbinfo-u, that will show all of the different domain accounts that exist on this test domain I'm working on with both GuyTB and GuyTB-DA in there, as well as some other default accounts for test purposes. So that proves that the binding has been successful. You don't need to do that bit, but it's good to know that it's working. You can check that everything's bound successfully at that point. The other thing, since we're here, we might as well go back into system and we should be able to set up our NTP. Go to general, click on NTP servers. So it's already got some on there. I'm not particularly fussed whether it's using the free BSD ones or the UK ones, so I'm going to leave that there. Finally, if we go into services, we want to turn a few of these on. So SMB is already turned on. We can see any configuration settings we've got here. I'm going to make its work group GuyTP as well. Get rid of the description on it. And I'm going to actually up the minimum supported level of SMB to version 2. Don't need to talk to old clients on it. And in case anything's stupid enough to try and use it, the newer versions are so much faster, it's just not worth the pain and hassle. And you notice on the guest account here, now we've also got all of our different accounts. So if we wanted to, we could use the domain guest account, the default account for Windows shares. Uh, we're going to hit OK on that. Oh, the other thing I forgot to do while I was in there, I don't want iSCSI to have SMB enabled on it on those cards. We only want it on the main LAN address. So we'll just tick that one to make sure it only binds to the single IP address. Then we're going to turn on iSCSI as well, because I'm going to be using iSCSI for sharing virtual disks. And in here, we will just change the bit at the end where it's org.freenas.ctl. CTL is the iSCSI daemon in FreeBSD. And we'll change that to org.gtp.gtp-san02 to give it a unique name and hit save. So that is the basics of it set up without getting into the iSCSI and the shares. And what we're going to do next is just that, moving on to setting up the actual disks themselves. Now what we're going to do is actually start creating some shares and a way to access it on FreeNAS. So we want to go into the storage tab. Now at the moment you'll see that no entry has been found. If we expand it here, you'll see there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in storage. The main place we want to start is in volumes though. If you've got existing disks that have got ZFS on them, then you can use import disk or import volume depending on what you're doing. But we're starting afresh here. So if we go on to view disks, we'll see the one, two, three, four, four terabyte drives that I have passed through to my NAS by passing through the SAS controller. And if we go on to view volumes, you'll notice at the moment we have no volumes. Now, in order to create a share, with FreeNAS, we first of all need to actually set up those volumes how we want to configure them. So forgetting FreeNAS, what we would do with storage would be to have a single disk acting as a drive by itself, 
or we'd have raid which could be a mirror where one disc copies exactly another one so that's pi redundancy we could have striping which is you write one byte onto one disc then the second byte onto a second disc the third byte onto a third disc fourth byte onto a fourth disc doesn't give you any redundancy but it does significantly increase speed you could mirror the stripe which is fast and redundant or one of the most common forms of raid is raid Five, which uses in a basic configuration one spare disk meaning if you've got five disks in your array you lose the capacity of approximately one disk and any one disk in that array can fail and the rest of them can carry on that gives you one of the best space to cost ratios which is why it's most common and also it's pretty quick however there's more and more concerns that the length of time it takes you to restore from a disk failure which could be days with terabyte disks that we now have you are then running with no additional redundancy during that time. So if you have a disk fail, and then when you're restoring another disk fails, you've got no way to get your data back in that configuration. And that's where you can then have RAID 6, which has got two disks for dealing with it. But things get more complex, and concepts a bit rotten, other things mean people are starting to think, actually, maybe this isn't the best way in the world to do it. And that's where ZFS, the file system that FreeNAS uses, which is fundamentally the file system originally of Solaris, I believe, and that FreeBSD now has, offers a way for addressing these storage issues. So if we, going back to here, go into View Volumes, we can click on Volume Manager, and we can create a new volume. Now, we've got a number of options here. So we could, we're going to call this one test volume and this is in effect the same as if we were setting up a RAID partition. So we are going to assign our disks and we're going to tell FreeNAS how we want to structure these in terms of data resiliency and redundancy. And this is why we want to pass the storage controller directly rather than doing RAID underneath this as otherwise we'd get into all kinds of confusion. So you give the volume a name, you choose if you want it to be encrypted and you can then Press the plus button to add all the disks if you want to. And then you can drag this little thing around. So this one to start with, if we just have DA0, then it's only a single disk. If we drag two of them across, then we've got a mirror of two disks. We could also change that on the drop down to make it a stripe of the two disks. And then if we wanted to, we could then go add an extra one. We could make them two sets of mirrors and then it would stripe those two mirrors. Lovely, then we've got the equivalent of RAID 10 with stripe mirror. But the one we're going to use is RAID Z, is the equivalent of RAID 5. We've also got RAID Z2 that would use two disks. So for our 16 terabytes of raw disk space, we get 11 terabytes with RAID Z. With RAID Z2, we'd get 7.2 terabytes. If we did the whole lot just as a mirror, we would get 3.6 terabytes out of it, which is basically only one drive, kind of pointless. If we did a stripe, we would get the full 14.5 terabytes, but absolutely no redundancy whatsoever. And if we were to make it so that we had a RAID 10 setup, we'd get 7.2 terabytes, which is pretty much the same as if we were to have RAID Z2 apart from it would be better performance. So in this case, it would then be down to a consideration of how much redundancy you wanted, because in this configuration, you could theoretically lose two disks if you lost DA3 and DA2 or DA1 and DA0. But if you lost 0 and 2 or 3 and 1 at the same time, then that would be it. Your entire setup would be broken. You could try and increase your odds in a situation like that by making sure they're from different manufacturing batches. But that would be how you create all the different array types. What we're going to do is just create a RAID Z, which is probably going to end up being the best balance between amount of storage we've got and performance and backup capabilities. Then once we've done that, we've got it called test volume, we click add volume. Now, although this is a volume in the context of ZFS, there's nothing actually on it and it is more like an uninitialized RAID away as far as we're concerned. Technically, on the file system, it does exist and we will be able to write files to it, but we need to do a couple of things in order to create shares, and that's what we're going to cover next. So once that's done, we can now see our volume, and we now see that 14.5 terabytes is the raw disk space, 10.5 terabytes is what we've got available. And you'll see here as well that by default, it puts LZ4 compression on on the disk. Now you can change that if you want, select the test volume, and then down at the bottom here, Press the little spanner and you can change LZ4 to be off if you want to remove all compression. Or you can make it super compressed and use GZIP maximum level compressions. Now, 
depending on the data you've got and what you care about here it gives you the option you want theoretically with an insanely unlimited processor you could go for the fastest level uh, i'm going to do some benchmarks at a later date and see which one works out best for now we're just going to leave it as off and turn off compression and again you can change the share type as to whether it's windows unix or mac for now we'll leave that as default and there's also an option for G deduplication Deduplication is a wonderful feature of ZFS, which theoretically means if you were to ex have the same files a thousand times on the disk, it would only take the disk space of one of those files. Now, this could be really useful if you were using a file share and you had Windows installed a hundred times, because actually you're only going to use the disk space of Windows once across all of those. However, it is a massive hog for performance if it's not configured correctly. So you need to be very, very careful where you put it on. And instead of paying for storage space, you are going to be paying for RAM and you are going to be paying for processor. And generally those are a lot more expensive than pure disk space these days. So unless you've got a very good need for it, leave it turned off. Uh, advanced mode shows you a few other things as well. Enable A time is, I uh, should turn off a time is access time. This means that whenever anything on the ZFS volume is accessed anyway, even if it's not updated, but just read or looked at, then A time will be updated, which is the default. If you're going to use this in VMware through NFS, then VMware looks at it all the time like crazy because it's the whole disk underneath it, in which case you're going to see performance drops. You might want to turn it off, but we're going to leave that for now. And you can set up quotas and other things on there, but we're going to just for now turn off compression. Whack edit data set. Now we've selected that, we can click if we wanted to view disks and we can actually see the disks that make up that partition. We could also click on the root level test volume and actually click down here to do volume status. And that would show us we've got a RAID Z1 and within that RAID Z1, everything's online. If I was to take a disk out now, that would show up as being offline there. So the next thing we want to do is start creating a share. So if we go back into our view volumes and we click on our test volume, what we want to do first of all then is create a data set. So we click the create data set button and we're going to give it a name and we're going to call this test data set. We'll leave the compression by default, but this is going to be a Windows file share. So we'll change its share type to Windows. We'll make it case insensitive because that's how Windows works. And we'll click add data set. And the cool thing here is you can change all of the settings we've done so that different parts of the disk act in different ways. You don't have to have compression, deduplication, everything exactly the same across the whole data set, which is great. Now we've got that test data set, we need to make a share out of it. So if we go into sharing, click on Windows SMB, and then do add Windows share. First thing we have to do is select what we're sharing. And then we get this kind of directory structure, which kind of represents what we just had. And we find our test data set. We can then give it a name of a share. We're going to call it test share. And we can either apply default permissions, which are the ones that are actually set on the ZFS itself, or we can change them. And there's lots of advanced options we can set here. We can specify whether hidden files are shown. We can check whether users can actually see this on the network. We can specify who is and who is not allowed to access it. But most of the time, all we're going to want to do is just give it a name and specify the path. I'm going to whack OK on that. And notice we haven't set any permissions up yet. So if we go back to it in our volume manager, click on to the test data set. And you'll notice down here we have a permissions button we can press. We press that and it gives us a chance to see who the owner is. So we've got our domain users, we've got our local ones. For now, I'm just going to use a local one we tested for a local user and group. And that should then grant access to my user account to that share. If we hit change, and then if we try and access that share, we then see our test share exists. And if we do a test copy at this point, you'll notice permission is denied. That's because I'm actually logged in with my domain account rather than the account we just specified. So it doesn't grant us access to it. We go back and change the permissions here and grant them to GuyTP slash GuyTP, which is my domain account, GuyTP and domain users. Then when we go in here this time and try and drag it across, this time you'll notice it works absolutely fine. And with absolutely no optimizations whatsoever, we are pulling in around about 90, 95 megabytes a second. Now, yes, we could do more than that. 
Um, so we're going to look in some benchmarks today to see how we can improve that. But for now, we'll cancel that file copy. But that's pretty good for absolutely no optimizations done so far apart from turning off compression. With Windows file shares done, there is one other thing we need to look at as well. And that is iSCSI. SCSI is a protocol for accessing disks. It originated way back many decades ago in early disk usage when IDE was the alternate parallel. And now we have SAS and SATA, where SAS is the modern SCSI protocol. Now, SCSI is just a more robust way of accessing disks. It tends to be what servers use versus ATA or IDE, which is what consumer devices offer. There are a number of ways SCSI can present itself, originally with physical cabling, then we've got the more modern serial SAS style, but you've also got the ability to have it over a fiber optic network, which is generally called a SAN, or an IP network, which is also called a SAN. So in effect, you can have your disks connected rather than through a SATA cable to your motherboard over your network switches, which is pretty cool. So if you have an entire tray of disks, you can literally have each of those disks expressed and connected to the network. And we can do that with FreeNAS as well and ZFS in that we can actually create a real physical disk that is backed by our, in effect, RAID 5 array and have that exposed to a virtual host. Now, a lot of different BIOSes and a lot of virtual BIOSes such as Hyper-V and VMware can actually boot off iSCSI directly, which is awesome. Failing that, VMware and ESXi, you can then actually have your volumes stored on an iSCSI volume, which means that we get all of the benefits of iSCSI even if we don't boot off it. So let's go and do some iSCSI. Slightly more complicated, but still pretty easy. And this time we're going to create something called a ZVOL. So yes, we've already got volumes. We've got different terminology. ZFS terminology is ho horrible here. We're going to create a ZVOL, which is in effect our disk that we're going to use for iSCSI. It's in effect just a block device, and we're going to give it a name, and we're going to call this test ZVOL for now. We're going to give it one terabyte in size. We're going to leave the compression to default. And again, you've got all these options that you can change for it. So you can either over-provision the total amount of disk space you've got if you know that actually everything's not going to be maxing out. I'm not going to do that because I like to actually know what my disk space is allocated to. And you can change block sizes and other things. This is useful if you're trying to align your block sizes with what's going to write to it. And we're then going to hit add ZVOL. So there we have one terabyte of space has now been used on our test ZVOL. And we now need to expose that through iSCSI. So if we go back to sharing and we go into iSCSI, we have to go through setting all of this up. Go into portals, click add portal. And then the portal is in effect the IP addresses that this machine is listing on. And you could have multiple portals all running on different ports, different IP addresses with different authentication methods assigned to them. For now, we're not gonna worry about authentication because that confuses it a little bit more. All we're going to do is create a test portal just for the sake of this video. We're going to call it test portal. You would be able to set authentication here if you wanted to for the entire portal, which says that you'd have to have a username and password matching various criteria in order to connect. And we're going to now leave this running on all IP addresses. But when we actually set this up properly, I'm going to have one for each of my iSCSI networks. But for now, we'll leave it there and hit OK. And what's that done is now it started listening to iSCSI connections on the default port on all IP addresses. So initiator is the side of an iSCSI connection that's actually connecting to the disk. And, and targets are the other side, they are the actual device itself. So because FreeNAS in our case isn't gonna to connect to any other side, we leave initiators blank, but you could have one FreeNAS here actually connecting to iSCSI storage and then offering that out through FreeNAS and ZFS if you wanted to. We're going to do it the other way around in this case. Authorized access here, if we wanted to, we could set up usernames and passwords that are required for iSCSI, but we'll leave those blank. From FreeNAS's perspective, targets are what's going to be connecting in. So this is, in effect, the name of the Windows PC or any other PC or any other system at all that's going to connect to FreeNAS. So we're going to click Add Target. We're going to give it a friendly alias first. We're going to call it Guy PC. 
And then in Windows, if we go into the Start menu and we type in iSCSI, you'll see iSCSI Initiator. Run that. You'll see a fully qualified host name with some Microsoft stuff at the start. Copy that and paste that into target name. Then again, we select our portal ID, which we just created. So each different computer can connect to a portal or more portals. We could add multiple ones of these if we wanted to. And then you also can have an initiated group ID if we've got authentication settings, other things done. But we're going to leave those blank for now. And we're going to click delete to delete the extra one we created. Hit OK. And we have to select something to shut the error validation up on that. But before we can save it, I'm going to have to cancel out here because unfortunately a bug in iSCSI means we can't delete that. So if we hit cancel, go back in, copy the name back in, call it IPC and select our test portal we created. Hit OK. So at this point, let's quickly go over where we are. We've given FreeNAS a name on the iSCSI network. We've told FreeNAS to listen for network connections and all IP addresses. We've ignored authentication and we've told it that Guy PC is going to be connecting in. What we haven't done is said what we're sharing or what Guy PC can access. So extents is saying what we're sharing. So we hit add extent, we give it a name, and we're going to call this iSCSI test. We're then going to have the choice of whether we are extent, which is what we're sharing is either a file on disk or an actual hardware device as far as ZFS is concerned. So we're going to just call it leave device and select our device. You could set a serial number here. You can change a whole bunch of other settings, but we're going to leave nothing else apart from default settings here. The only one worth mentioning is the RPM that's reported to the host system that's using this. As it says here, one reason to leave it as SSD is to stop host operating systems trying to do things like defragment it, because at the end of the day, ZFS manages all of that for us, and we don't need the data becoming less organized and less optimized than we want it to. So the default is leave it as SSD, and I'd recommend doing the same. Then hit OK. We've now said what we're sharing, but we haven't said what Guy PC can access. That's this last tag, associated targets where we simply go, let's get Guy PC and let's give it iSCSI test. If we had multiple things we were giving Guy PC, you have to give them a whole bunch of numbers to say what they can see. Once we've done that, we hit OK. And now very quickly again, we've said, listen for iSCSI on the network. This is my name on the network. Guy PC is allowed to connect. I'm sharing this Z volume and Guy PC is mapped to that Z volume. Done. Slightly complicated, but in future, if I was going to add another volume, in fact, we could do it quickly now, go into view volumes, click on our test volume, add another Z volume. So we'd call this one second Z vol, we'll call this one five gigabytes. Then we'd go back into sharing. And then iSCSI, now what we need to do is create another extent where we'd have the second Z vol. And then again, we could give that one on LUN1 second vol. And now Guy PC will be able to see both of those. So it's a lot quicker to add subsequent ones once you've done the initial one time setup. Once we've done all of that, we go back into our iSCSI initiator. And on the targets tab, because remember we're now in Windows. So as far as Windows is concerned, FreeNAS is the target. You put the IP address or host name on your network in, then hit quick connect. It confirms login succeeded. We're successfully connected, hit done. And at this point, we should be able to go into computer management in Windows and see our newly connected disks. And as if by magic, as soon as we've had iSCSI, we now see two new disks on the system that Windows says we need to initialize. We'll let it initialize them. And then we have a look. We have our one terabyte volume and our five gigabyte volume that we created. And we can just treat these now, as far as Windows is concerned, these are physical disks that we have. They're not network drives. They're not shares. These are proper full-on disks. So we can create a new volume on the terabyte drive, call it drive E, format it as NTFS. And as far as absolutely everything on our system is concerned, that is a local disk. There we are. Our new volume has appeared. And if we do something here we can treat it just like anything else in windows we can do windows file sharing on it we can do all the permissions that we'd be able to it's a full ntfs volume there is not a hint of unixy backend anywhere here which is great particularly for virtual machines which is what i'm going to be using this for so it's probably also worth us having a very quick look at the performance on this as well and if we start copying that same file from earlier over you'll notice there's really interesting thing here in that it peaks massively around the gigabyte 
byte a second to start with before it settles down to the correct speed. I believe this is where Windows is doing a bunch of caching before it figures out what speed it's actually running at and misreports for the file copy. But we're settled into a slightly quicker speed than we had before, but with these weird dips where something happens before it goes back up. And I'm going to do a separate video after this looking at the performance and how to stabilize this out because theoretically iSCSI is a faster option and we certainly get higher peaks, but there are these weird dips that we need to look at. So we'll stop that one copying now. And there we are. If we want to be on the safe side, since I'm about to go and delete a bunch of things, we can offline those two disks. And then in our iSCSI initiator, we can actually disconnect from there. Confirm we want to disconnect. And we can even then remove that portal so that Windows is no longer expecting to see iSCSI devices there. So if we then want to remove any of these, the best practice is to go and delete this from here first of all, so we can get rid of our mappings for everything. We can then get rid of the extents, which is saying that we're going to share these things out. And if we go back over to our volumes, we're able to remove the Zvols completely. Once we've done that, if we want to get rid of the data set that we had for the Windows file share, same again, click it and destroy it. And then finally, if we want to, we can actually get rid of the entire ZFS volume for our RAID data set that we created. At this point, we can say we're going to completely destroy the data and get rid of it and get rid of any configuration that's left on it. Hit yes. And that's it. Everything's completely removed and back to a blank state for us to start figuring out how we actually want it. Well, that's it. The end of my whole NAS series. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about my NAS setup, how I've used virtualization in it, and how I've got free NAS work. If you've got any questions, comments, please leave them below. Don't forget to press like if you enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe. You can catch me on Facebook and Twitter at GuyRobotTV, and catch you next time. Thanks.